Assalamu alaikum. Hello, everybody. My name is Jana Mazurkiewicz Meisarosz. I'm the founder of our organization, the Yiddish Arts and Academics Association of North America. I'm extremely happy to host this conversation about the Yiddish uh, drug king. It's the topic that not everybody is familiar with, and this is a very important part of our mission to share uh, such amazing stories. So we have a fantastic guests with us, Natalie and Ashley, who are involved in the project of um, getting us familiar with Pepe Littmann. I would like both of you to introduce yourselves briefly and sure. tell us about, if you have any Yiddish connection, tell us about your Yiddish connection. <laughs> well, for me, um, my Yiddish connection is literally Pepe. I'm a writer. My name is mm -hmm. Natalie Altoin and I I was uh, writing a project uh, researching early 20th century performers and came across Pepe and dived down that rabbit hole and, and didn't resurface for quite some time. Um, Pepe Lippmann astounded me in many ways um, and, um, and started me on quite an incredible journey. And my link to this project is that I also have a very good uh, friend of mine, now two Drag King friends, um, but my, my friend uh, LJ Parkinson, um, they are a Drag King. And I spoke to LJ and said, wow, did you know that there were Drag Kings performing a hundred years ago? And they were the top billed acts, not just in Europe, but around America and in the UK. And LJ said, of course, they're my role model. This is this person's my role model. And I said, have you heard of Pepe Littman? And LJ said, nope. And then I contacted Yiddish societies and they said, no, nope, don't know of Pepe Littman. And the people that knew of Pepe Littman were the Jewish drag kings. And so that's the beginning of the project for me. And I started looking for Jewish drag kings in the UK and found Ashley. Hi, so I'm Ashley Loeb. Um, I thought I would, this is this is me as my drag persona um, who goes by the name uh, Rabbi Schmecki Platzowitz, um, <laughs> which, so basically Rabbi Schmecki came about because although I'm not a, a Yiddish speaker, I come from a Jewish family and um, I have um, ancestors who, who uh, at one point would have spoken fluent Yiddish, um, but to be honest, uh, Rabbi Shmeki came about because I came up with the name first and I was so tickled by it, to be honest, um, that I started working on an act and um, uh, since then, so my, the main theme of my um, drag persona is, is sort of Jewishness and queerness and um, the intersection of both really. Um, and it's also a, a bit of a play with, I guess, traditional um, ideas of uh, masculinity and femininity um, within Jewish culture. Um, uh, and a lot of my, a lot of my songs, so I usually, what I mostly do is I uh, sing parody songs and most of my songs are either about Jewish themes or um, they're particularly British Jewish themes. Um, yeah, and as far as I know, uh, it seems that I'm the only drag king that uses Jewishness in my act in Britain anyway. Um, so rather exciting. Yeah. Hello. Amazing. Nice to have the wonderful Dr. Phil who um unfortunately dr phil alexander is a, a yiddish and klezmer musician and mm -hmm. and um and is just an all right all round wonderful human being that um very last minute unfortunately couldn't make it but uh mm -hmm. sat down and recorded a video for us to watch tonight and i'm excited to see it because he's discovered more information about Pepe litman only in the last couple of days um, so I'll also be learning more things today um, and uh, I'll pass over to Yana, but we can decide when we want to play that video. Well, as 
as a matter of fact, we could play it right now. Maybe it would be an introduction to Dr. Phil. Sure. Do you want no? to do that? Um, okay. So we will give people some context also. So that's good. Absolutely. What maybe what I should do is just tell you a little bit about the context of the project. Okay. Um, Perfect. just a little bit so that you can understand how Dr. Phil kind of came in and and um so basically Make Me a King is about a is a fiction film. It's the very first fiction film about a drag king, a contemporary drag king, never mind a Jewish drag king who is obsessed and connected to the only constant in their life um which is peppy Littman. um so our protagonist is a young uh girl named uh, ari who begins to play with gender at a young age when they see themselves for the first time they see themselves represented back in an image and that is the image of peppy Littman. peppy Littman was a male impersonator. So uh, dressed as a, a male cosset at times, or much like the image that Ashley showed you, um, what Ashley does, and um, and was like part of the Buddha Zinger and um, performed around the world and essentially carved out a, a space for drag kings over a hundred years ago. And our, our fiction film, um, uses Peppy's memory and honors Peppy in the sense that it allows another young performer to find their voice and to embrace their own authenticity through Peppy's Yiddish music. Um, uh, can you please uh, explain to people who don't know who uh, the brother Zinger were? Yeah, well, Phil's gonna actually. So. Okay, perfect. <laughs> Go ahead. Then. I to watch the very beginning of his, so I'm excited. So, um, so please tell me if um if there are any massive problems. I hope that mm -hmm. there aren't. <clears throat> Let me do share. Mm -hmm. Let me screen. And here we go. I'll begin this now. Shalom mm Aleichem, -hmm. everybody. I'm sorry not to be with you for the live chat, um, but I thought I'd record a little bit of what I've discovered about Pepe's life, uh, and particularly from her Silbert's Feig's Lexicon for Yiddish and Theater. So I'm going to start off with a little reading from an obituary, uh, which is from Unser Express, I think, uh, and it's titled At the Grave of Pepe Littman. Ota zoi gehen sie weg von der Welt, elend, arm, verlost von einem molliger Freund, vergessen von einem molliger und seliger Verräter. Was Jüdische Aktoren, jüdische Aktristen senden es die, was azoi is ungezeichnet sehr geurl. Wie lang ist es, als jüdische Theater hat gemusst in Stallen gespielt werden? Wie lang ist es, als Esther Rochel Kaminska hat mit ihr Truppe wie mit der Zigeiner Bande gemusst in Beuden herumwandern? Wie lang ist es, als man hat gemusst spielendig jüdisch Theater Zittern für jeder Pristav, für jeder Okolochni. Wie lange ist es, als ein paar Bretter übergeworfen über ein lediger Gas, haben aufgehört zu dienen als Biene für jüdische Theater. Und derfahr toren mir nicht keinmal auf kein Rege erfüllen, nicht vergessen, ob die alle, was haben mit seiner Arbeit, mit seiner Keuches, geholfen, Arois führen, das jüdische Theater, von die Beuten, von die Stahlen. Derfahr toren mir keinmal nicht vergessen, oh, excuse me, derfahr toren mir keinmal nicht vergessen, als die Verdiensten von diejenigen, was haben die Erste genommen, brechen die Eisener Wand, was ist gestanden zwischen jüdische Theater und der Welt. I'm gonna read you a little translation of that. And this is how they leave the world, alone, 
poor, deserted by previous friends, forgotten by previously countless followers and devotees who had grasped their hands, who had kissed their footsteps. They die in a stranger's shroud, in a far-flung cemetery somewhere, in an unloved corner somewhere in a hospital. Such is the fate of Jewish actors and actresses. Jewish stage folk are destined to end their lives this way, and just as their life is alone, so is their death. What life? How long is it since Jewish theatre had to be performed in stables? How long is it since Esther Rochel Kaminska was forced to travel in wagons with her troop like a band of gypsies? How long is it since people had to perform Jewish theatre, anxious about every drunken police constable and okolochny? How long is it since a few boards thrown down on an empty street were made to serve as a stage for Yiddish theatre? And that's why we must never forget, not even for a moment, all those who, with their work, with their force, with their strength, helped to lead Yiddish theatre out of the wagons, out of the stables. That's why we must never forget that the service of those is what it first took to break down the iron wall that stood between Yiddish theatre and the world. That's a kind of um, overblown obituary, but it gives you some sense of where Pepe Lippmann stood in the history of Jewish theatre. Um, biographical material is kind of sketchy on Pepe, and as I said, the majority of what we have comes from Zalman Zilbertzweig's Lexicon for Yiddish and Theater. And Zilbertzweig uh, points out that Pepe was um, part of a Brodersinger troupe and eventually went on to lead this Brodersinger troupe. Uh, Brodersinger was a kind of general name for itinerant Jewish musicians, Yiddish musicians and players, singers, performers who would travel uh, to towns, cities, uh, shtetls, and they would set up stages wherever they arrived and they would perform. And they often had a range of stock characters and stock kind of sketches. And certainly Pepe had a stock character, as I'm sure you'll be talking about or have already talked about in this chat, um, which was her kind of yeshiva bocha, a uh, Hasidic um, lad that she was very well known for. And one of the reviews, in fact, said that this role really could have been written for her and she certainly made it her own. Uh, the interesting thing, a kind of sad thing that I've discovered, is that Pepe was fated and celebrated throughout her life and performed in uh, Russia, in Romania, in Poland, went to the States, she performed in Vienna, she performed in Paris, in London, but she did something happened. And I'm going to read you a little bit more from one of these obituaries now to explain a bit what happens. Actually, no, first of all, I'm not going to do that. First of all, I'm going to read you a bit about how Pepe met uh, her husband, Yanko Lippmann. Now, Zilberzweig says that Pepe met Yanko. He was already part of a Brodersinger's troupe, which may be true. Um, the Vorwärts, uh, uh, the New York Yiddish newspaper, in its obituary of Pepe in 1930, gives a slightly more romantic um, storytelling. <laughs> I'm going to read you just a little bit of that. A little, again, a little bit of the Yiddish, and then a bit more of the English translation. Okay, so this is talking about Pepe when she's a young girl. First of all, she was uh, from a poor family, and she was sent off. Um, she was from Ternopol uh, uh, in Galicia, and she was sent off to act as a servant girl um, at a tailor's um, in a shtetl called Roman. And this is what it says about Pepe when she was young. Okay. Uh, Pepe is a schöne, gesunde jüdische Mädel. Sie pflegt a Räumläufen a ganze Tag a Barfisa und pflegt singen jüdische, rumänische und ukrainische Volkslieder. Die Einwohner pflegen in die sommerdicke Farnachten sich versammeln beim Schneiders Fensterl und sich mechaia sein von der Mädels süße Lieder. Einmal Stehendig vertieft in der Arbeit bei Abalia Vesch, hat die kleine Peppi gesungen das erste Gesang von Avrahams Kloglied in Goldfadens Akedos Yitzchok. A junger Soldat, Janko Littmann, hat vorbei marschiert mit der Abteilung und hat der Herd Peppis Gesang. 
Er ist später gekommen zum Schneiders Fenster und geführt mit Pepin ein Gespräch. Sie haben sich verliebt und beschlossen, Chassene zu haben, wenn er wird euch dienen. Let's give you a little, uh, little translation of that. Pepi was a beautiful, healthy Jewish girl. She ran around barefoot all day and used to sing Yiddish, Romanian and Ukrainian folk songs. On summer evenings, the inhabitants used to gather around the tailor's window and delight in the girl's sweet songs. From time to time in Roman, a Yiddish theatre troupe would play. Pepi was a regular attendee. She would absorb the Yiddish songs and in the morning would be able to sing them, just as if she'd heard them dozens of times before. Every evening, the girl ran to the theatre to hear and see the shows. With the last of her hard-earned pennies, she would buy a ticket and enter the gallery in order to learn songs. One time, standing deep in a wash tub, the young Peppy sang the first song from Abraham's Lament in Goldfaden's The Sacrifice of Isaac. A young soldier, Yanko Littman, was marching by with his squad and heard Peppy singing. Later on, he went back to the tailor's window and engaged Peppy in conversation. They fell in love and decided to get married when he finished his service. I think I prefer that version of events, even if it's a slightly romanticized one. Now, as uh, Nat has probably explained, Peppy um, performed throughout Europe and made a lot of money and was very celebrated. Uh, in one of another of her obituaries uh, in Der Moment, which was a, a Warsaw Yiddish newspaper, there's an interesting point made that um, not only did Pepe perform on Jewish stages or Yiddish stages, she also performed in places where there weren't Jewish stages. And uh, notably, perhaps, um, in Budapest, according to the moment. Uh, and I, mean, I think maybe I'll just read straight from the English translation here. I'm not sure. Uh, I don't know whether this is a Yiddish Gespräch or, a, or an English Gespräch, so I'll, I'll go for the English. Um, so this is talking about Pepe and Yanko's uh, traveling troop and Pepe's success. And it says, in time they joined with different Yiddish theater troops and toured the farthest flung, pla the farthest flung places of Jewish settlement. Peppy Lippmann had great success everywhere she went and had already, 30 or 40 years ago, so this is 1930, so already in the late 19th century, she had already become a star. She performed in Russia, Romania, Poland, London, Paris, Vienna, Budapest, as well as other places. Especially interesting were her appearances in Budapest, where she moved in aristocratic circles, and in fact, she was quite well known for numbering uh, princes and counts among her friends, as well as Yiddish writers like Mendel and Moicha Svorim. There were no Jewish stages there at that time. She appeared on Hungarian stages with her Yiddish repertoire. It was from her that assimilated Hungarian Jews learned of the existence of a Yiddish theater and Yiddish folk song. She was offered large fees to sing in Romanian or Hungarian, but she turned these down. Seeing herself as a Yiddish actress, she didn't want to perform in any other language. So, not only um, a genre-breaking actor in terms of gender and in terms of roles and in terms of uh, the expectations of, um, of Yiddish theatre, but also of gendered roles within theatre, but she was also a kind of... Um, a Yiddish activist, a Yiddishist, uh, which is nice to know. However, as I said, there's a sad side to Pepe's story. Um, she seems to have amassed a large fortune before the war, before the First World War, and spent the First World War itself in Russia. Um, she was unable to get out from there uh, during the war. And I'll read you a little bit more from the Forverts, uh, from the Forverts obituary, which seems to explain what happened um, and kind of points to the, the sad fate that uh, seemed to await quite a lot of uh, Yiddish actors and artists. Maybe still does. Before the war, Pepe Lippmann had savings of 22,000 Austrian gold crowns in Budapest and Chernovitz banks. With this money, she wanted to organize a wedding for her only daughter, Lyuba, who was still in Russia. But there was nothing left of her savings, just worthless paper IOUs. Now, I'm not sure what that means. This is writing 
uh, towards the end of the 20s. Um, this is the, the time that they're talking about is towards the end of the 1920s, when Pepe was in her 50s. Uh, and I'm not quite sure what happened to her savings. It's a little hard to tell. Either that they were all kind of promissory notes that didn't come good, um, or uh, they were shares, which, uh, you know, kind of went bad. Um, I'm either my sense of global finance or my uh, grasp of the Yiddish language is not sufficient to understand exactly what happened. But safe to say that she had a fortune which she didn't kind of fritter away. The fortune went somehow. Um, and the Forvets of Victory goes on to say, Pepe took strongly to heart the material poverty of her later years. She began to comprehend the great tragedy of life's triviality. Working hard your whole life, and for what? What could she do with her previous successes? Could she survive in her later years on the mountain of newspaper clippings, critical acclaim, and reviews of her art? Until the last days of her life, Pepe had masses of friends and devotees, but none of them knew the big secret, that Pepe Lippmann, the great rich artiste, for the most part of her days in Vienna, simply went hungry. No one knew the big tragedy, that Pepe Lippmann was buried in a charity shroud. Mm -hmm. so we have a very sad end to Pepe's colourful uh, and dramatic and groundbreaking life. I don't want to dwell on that sadness, but I feel it's an important part of her biography, which one only discovers from reading these obituaries. <clears throat> I'm fascinated by Pepe. I'm fascinated by her music. I think she was also not just um, a uh, cross-dresser, but she was a cross-singer. Um, if you listen to her recordings, you will hear there's a, a her alto voice almost kind of into a high tenor voice actually subverts gender expectations of uh, of voice production as well as her onstage get up subverted gender expectations of um of dress and of performance and for that reason as well i think it's uh, she's a fascinating character so i'm going to carry on with my researches here and uh hopefully be able to update you all uh, as I go on and as the film gets made. Um, I hope you have a great talk for the rest of this session and I look forward to catching up with everybody uh, very soon. Okay, bye. Was that good for everybody? Could you hear that? Yes, amazing. The yeah, there was some a little break, but I think with the translation, we got the, we got the message, right? Pretty much. Yeah, that's fascinating. Uh, one thing that there was no uh, no mention of, and it's fascinating to me, is that uh, Pepe was in fact a religious person, because it's extremely rare um, to find religious people among performers, because the lifestyle doesn't necessarily permit, you know, <laughs> this, this kind of uh, approach to religion. So maybe you could elaborate a little bit on that? Yes, from what from what we read anyway, um, Pepe was observant, um, but still the Brudersinger and Pepe were, you know, for the emancipation and the modernization of the Jews, of the Jewish people. Um, and, and that's why a lot of folk when I speak to them say they were like, they were like the Saturday Night Live, you know, they did really sat satirical sketches and, um, and they really pushed the boundaries they um she uh she she when you read um and everybody please go and 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 have a read even on the wikipedia page there are some amazing reviews of peppy um just bystanders who watched and the the reviews are stellar that peppy peppy stole the show yes i've seen can we hear a bit of peppy's voice absolutely um why don't I, uh, I wonder if, if it would be interesting to, to pass over to Ashley to chat a little bit about, um, sorry, I'm taking over you on. I'm just thinking I'll go and look for Peppy, but if you want to ask Ashley some questions, then I can do that. Absolutely. Of course, of course we can do that and we can give people links so they could listen, you know, yeah. themselves. I'll, I'll put it in the chat. Right. Tell us, so the movie, did you start actually making the movie or you're waiting? 
uh, still for the campaign to to end? What are you in the process? So we, so we have a, a Kickstarter. Ashley, do you want to chat about it? Yeah, there you go. Yeah, absolutely. So we um, we have, in fact, uh, if Natalie can also drop a, a link in the chat, I'm sure, I'm sure she will. Um, uh, we have a Kickstarter. Um, we um, the script which was written by Natalie. Um, won the uh, Pears uh, short film prize, which is a, a, a UK Jewish film um, prize fund. Um, however, uh, that doesn't, it would be enough to, to make the bare bones of what, of what the vision of the, of the film was. Um, so we are fundraising for a little bit more um, to, add the bells and whistles that we'd like to, to tell this story, um, you know, as best as we can really. Um, so yeah, so as far as I know, um, filming, casting is in pro progress. Um, filming has not begun, um, but um, we're underway and, and it will be made regardless. However, we're hoping that we can do the story justice more than um, just, making the bare bones of it effectively perfect that's absolutely right and i see somebody's put the allegra oh wonderful our marketer marketing person thank you allegra <laughs> on it um has put the kickstarter link there um we would love any support that you can give be that you know a, a, a pound or a dollar or wherever you are in the world um that would be incredibly helpful for us. We're actually not far off our goal. And with Kickstarter, it's all or nothing. So if we don't reach our goal, then nobody's uh, donations come to us. So that's why we're very grateful um, to Yana for, um, for helping us to spread the word. And just above that Kickstarter link, there is a link to Pepe. Um, and, uh, it's like 70 minutes of Peppy singing. And what's wonderful is you, what Phil said is right. It's quite amazing how Peppy's voice changes. I'm a vocalist myself. I sing, so is Ashley. And we're, it's quite phenomenal. I mean, at times Peppy sounds like, you know, a high alto and at times like a man and uh, like a tenor and I suppose I'm like that. I sing, I, I used to sing tenor in the choir, but, and at times, um, uh, Peppy sounds very operatic and at other times it's very um, uh, resuscitate like um, uh, like quite speaky quite comic um, patter songs which is obviously our Yiddish folk song but we're used to hearing that um, as well as the kind of soaring lyrical um, songs uh, that that Peppy sang so I can play some of it if you'd like um, I can't see everybody. So what do you think? Yana? I think people are nodding. So maybe a little bit. Okay. Abyssal. Sure. Abyssal. <laughs> so let me share again and I'll, what I can do is I can just share um, just the sound. Mm -hmm. Here it comes.
I'll play you another one because there's a couple of different kind of stuff that she does. But I would I would suggest that's a it's a great listen. Here's another. This is one of her famous, very famous ones that everybody writes about. Which you probably. Know. I'll stop there so, because I think otherwise we could uh, we could listen to Peppy for the whole session. But wonderful <laughs> voice, and I would uh, I would uh, recommend that link is great because it has a whole load of her tracks. Right. Also, maybe we should say that performing in drag was not that uncommon, right? Rochel Kaminska, Ida Kaminska, they both performed uh, in drag. And that was also true for big European stars, not only, you know, Yiddish theater, but also other female stars. So maybe we could talk a little more about that. Yes, of course. Do you want to, Ashley? Or do you want yeah, me to? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, uh, there were a variety of reasons why male impersonation was sort of quite successful. I mean, it was seen as transgressive, but it was also quite um, provocative uh, to an extent, sort of sexually. Um, uh, and it's interesting. It's one of those very interesting things, because obviously, currently, um, you know, there's a big boom in drag queens, which would obviously have been far more transgressive at, at that age, uh, in, in those days. Um, but to an extent, um, male impersonation and drag kinging as it has become sort of now, um, it's had a bit of a, in, in sort of the, the, the last few years, it's been less popular. Very, very recently, um, drag kinging has has taken off. Uh, in fact, a, probably quite a lot more in the US than it has in the UK. Um, and what's quite interesting, and again, this isn't sort of necessarily connected, but what's quite interesting is that um, my sense of the Yiddish um, the, the Yiddish, the Yiddish speaking has also become sort of less, it's, it's been almost lost at times and has become less sort of popular. And there's very much a renaissance, um, I believe both in the US um, and, and very recently in the UK. Um, so it's quite interesting how the sort of the cultural um, fashions, as it were, go in and out of, and it, it's just very interesting that these, these two, not necessarily entirely connected, but obviously overlapping um, uh, cultural touch points have had previously been very successful and then uh, fallen out of favor and then become rec very recently rather more successful again. Yeah, I think it's really interesting. I mean, LJ um, Parkinson, who is an award-winning drag king, um, not not Yiddish, not Jewish, um, like our wonderful Ashley. Um, their hero is Hetty King, um, who performed as a male impersonator well into um, her late seventies. She performed up until three months before she died. It was it was a vocation for these people. It was something. It wasn't just um, an act. It was something that that it was their alter ego, and. Um, I, I find that fascinating that somebody as a performer myself, and I'm sure Ashley are the same, that that's all they did. 
you know, a lot of, a lot of these um, male impersonators. And I find that quite fascinating. So like Vesta Tilly, everybody knows after the ball was a, a film uh, that was about Vesta. Um, uh, Hetty King is another one, but then you've also got, you know, um, uh, um, drag Kings that, um, that also kind of were into that showed the intersections as well. You know, you've got people of color drag Kings, you've got, um, uh, that there was just a range of people that actually kind of we lost in history for a while that have suddenly start people are starting to know about them again so it's quite fascinating it's also fascinating that until um, Pepe lost all her money she was successful she was surviving <laughs> first of all she was surviving as an artist and then she made it she performed not only on Yiddish stage but also um, I would imagine maybe for German speaking audience because her Yiddish was close to Deutsch Marisch at times, so she could easily adjust her performance, you know, and be understood by German speaking audiences. That's my understanding, right? And that's fascinating. Although, from what I understand, Pepe never made it to theater, theater, right? It was more like Klein Kunst. So uh, yes, I mean that's something that that I did ask Dr. Phil because I think you know it sounds like um yeah it was I'm not we're not absolutely sure mm -hmm. because the way that she was spoken about was that she was you know one of the top build she was top build you know she was in London she did vaudeville with the rest of them but I don't that's something that I I I don't know about you Ashley if you've ha have anything to say about that but I mean we're still we're still digging and thankfully to Dr. Phil, you know, he's, he's got resources that we don't, which is fantastic. We've got the internet. He's able to go into like the old chronicles, which is fantastic. So we will bring more back to you actually. Yeah. And it's interesting what you say about German speaking. My, um, I would say that I'm more familiar with German than I am with Yiddish. Um, although of course, um, I had family members that, that at one point would have spoken Yiddish. I, I no longer have anybody uh, within my family that speaks fluent Yiddish, although it, it is something that I'm, I'm uh, looking to do is, is, is to learn Yiddish because it's just a fascinating language. Um, but it is, it is interesting how uh, what Dr. Phil was saying in Yiddish, I probably was able to sort of understand, you know, a fair degree of it. Um, uh, and he was not speaking Deutsch Merisch, right? Because there are different no. dialects and different kinds of Yiddish. Uh, and uh, very often Yiddish performance would use Deutsch Merisch to reach uh, German speaking audience. So. Yeah, yeah. And there's, I mean, well, there's a long, long tradition of kind of adapting Yiddish performance to be more kind of uh, fit with with the the world the, the the more secular world that it was uh, and the more assimilated world that it was it was performed in um because uh i mean presumably because yiddish speaking was was a it was a small uh community and probably probably not a very wealthy uh community either I was about to say the fact that that you was financially not miserable <laughs> That's mostly, you know, could have been because she performed both for the Yiddish audience and for the non-Yiddish speakers. And for princes. And so she performed for royalty and collected them as friends. Um, and the other kind of early 20th century performers, the magicians and, uh, you know, that, that the male impersonators were all, you know, they all they all ran in those same circles. They did the same. It was very much that they were summoned to court um, to perform and would get lavish gifts. And that's where that's where the money was made. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and that's why I found it so sad that uh, that Pepe, you know, died penniless, but but nobody knew um, who knows how much of that is embellished. But um, mm -hmm. but it's really I mean, it's it's it feels like I mean, that just breaks my heart. Yes, uh, I have a similar story in my family where my grand great grandmother had some huge savings and uh, sold her. Um, she had some um, 
tenement house she was renting. She sold it and then the, this huge reform came in, the financial reform, and then next day she bought shoes for the same money, you know, the tenement house worth sum of money turned into shoes. <laughs> So that was a common problem for many people um, of yeah. the era. Yes, absolutely. I wonder if um, if if there are uh, folks who have questions also about um, the film and and where that's going. I'm not sure um, if there. Oh. Well, that was exactly. I think that was the current change. That's what it was in for my great grandma, and I think my, it might have been the same. Uh, event. That's the question that I saw in the chat. Also, some people were asking, uh, maybe we could elaborate on what the songs were about that Pepe was singing. And that's when I had Dr. Phil because I don't speak Yiddish. So I can't help you there. But I think what we should do is if there are um, specific questions that we want to ask Dr. Phil, he did say that what he would do is either do some more videos or come back and do another chat with everybody because he couldn't be here tonight. Um, so you get him twice. Not a bad, not a bad deal. Um, but I, I'm, uh, I've, there are, I've got translations um, for different songs. I mean, some of the songs that I've trans that I've got translations for were as simple as, um, so Pepe dressed up as a man, um, but singing about how, you know, got to marry this woman and she's the farmer's daughter and um is really quite like um uh, uh what i would say like describing village life but in quite a comical way so they were quite satirical and sketchy but also kind of taking the mick a little bit and going hey gentlemen this is what you look like um <laughs> which a lot of the male but the the gentlemen of the time loved it um because they were laughing at themselves you know mm -hmm. um and I think that's what I, oh, somebody said their choir sings a peppy song. Amazing. Mm -hmm. So um, maybe that person, I would, I would love to hear what their choir song's about, actually. Uh, but yeah, that's what I, I translated. It was a lot of village life um, and their act from what I could see uh, was very funny. They, they found her very funny. So safe, she... safe. I don't know if you are able to unmute yourself. Uh, a lot of questions, yes. you know. <laughs> um, hi, yes. So I sing with the Vancouver Jewish Folk Choir, and um, and a couple of years ago, one of our members adapted this book, this song called "Gitebri der Nicht Gehabt." Um, for for our choir, and uh, actually, the person who sings the lead is a. In, is also a well-known drag queen here in Vancouver. So uh, it sort of has some nice resonances. Um, okay. We're happy to share the arrangement with anybody who wants it. Mm -hmm. Amazing. That, what, is, and what is the song about? It's about how uh, if, if you're a gentleman and you're, and you're uh, going to visit a young lady who you might be interested in, maybe you shouldn't let your hands wander. <laughs> while you're doing that uh so it is it is very much an anti-sexual harassment song i would if if there's any possibility that you can get that arrangement over to me i would you absolutely I'm, that is so exciting that you okay have i'm gonna put my email in the um in the chat and anybody Perfect. who wants it just just drop me a note and i'll send it over to you i, I there's no problem sharing it we're uh, we're love we're happy to share our music Thank Fabulous. you. I believe she also, didn't she um, also sing a song about um, couples in the shtetl who wanted to conceive and couldn't and how perhaps the, um, the, the rabbi, rabbi may, what's that? The rabbi got involved. Yes, how the rabbi may, uh, may yeah, help them with that with that problem um which is which is quite hilarious really wow well some of the songs that uh, she sang are popular now like hot aida weibel uh, that's a popular song that other people are singing right now so they are not all of they are not all that obscure i imagine in the movie you'll have quite a bunch of songs right yes absolutely um Basically, the film will be peppy from start to finish. Um, 
were with incidental music in between. So, um, you know, Pepe was the inspiration for the film, for the short, but also Pepe is the inspiration for our protagonist. So we, we begin the film with, I don't want to give too much away, but we begin the film with um, our protagonist's father introducing her as a six-year-old to, um, to Pepe, to Yiddish folk song and to that era. And, um, and while the film has that kind of specificity and we're focusing down on, on to, to that intersection of, um, of drag, uh, but also of, of um, music, of Yiddish music, it's also got a really kind of universal, it's got lots of universal themes. Uh, the film is about belonging and embracing your authentic self. And I think the reason why, you know, I'm grateful to the Pears Foundation Short Film Fund and UK Jewish Film for giving us a chance because it, it is controversial, you know, we're, we're talking about a, a Jewish strike king that, um, not just the one that lived 100 years ago, but one that's operating now. Um, and it, you know, at the moment, it's quite a volatile um, uh, atmosphere, I would say. Um, I mean, maybe Ashley can can chat more about that. But but yeah, it's really it's it's an interesting time, and I think that I'm grateful to the pairs and UK Jewish Film for giving us a chance to to make this um, and to share it because it's uh, it's an important film at this time. I feel sure. Uh, there was one more question in the chat. Do we know why uh, Pepe thought that uh, she would have to? Uh, keep her poverty in secret towards her the end of her life I mean I don't I don't know we can only surmise I guess you know um uh pride I'm not mm -hmm. sure <laughs> you know I'm, I'm really not sure um I think losing your fortune when it's not your fault when it's a when it's um when you go from riches to rags that's uh that must be a difficult uh fall yeah Somebody's saying this precisely, but I'm not sure about. Oh, oh no, no, this is about the. Oh, it say. <laughs> well, for people, not everybody can see the chat. For instance, our Facebook audience can't see the chat. So uh, the, I can, uh, I can uh, basically read the question. Uh, Sasha uh, found some uh, information about sex pieces, sex plays mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, Bella, Bellarina and Boris Auerbach were staring in and she's asked they are asking if um, girls under 16 not allowed what if anybody has more information about uh, this kind of uh, <laughs> pieces sex pieces i've never heard about that i don't know anything about that maybe somebody else does well that's why we are asking uh, here and on facebook maybe somebody who knows happens to know will reach out to us right um yeah does anybody have more questions i think ashley you wanted to say something and i interrupted maybe no that's okay it's interesting um especially right now uh well i also also back then i mean the the link between um yiddish and uh lgbt people um is also quite long-standing and i think especially in the uk um, so in the, uh, mainly in London, um, there was a, a language that was developed, uh, among gay people when, uh, when gay people were outlawed, basically, but before, before, um, uh, homosexuality was decriminalized, um, which, uh, the, the language was called Polari, if, if anybody is interested in looking up, looking it up. Um, but one of the things that is interesting about it is it, it, it was sort of the language of the dispossessed. And because of that, um, it took quite a lot of uh, words from Yiddish, um, as well as from, I think, Gypsy and um, kind of, uh, other kinds of cant that were um, used by uh, less desirable peoples, maybe, should we say. Um, and so um, I know that now as well in the UK, um, uh, fairly recently, we have had a, um, 
uh, a queer Yiddish anarchist cafe that was set up in, in Glasgow called De Rosa Pava, um, the Pink Peacock. And um, yeah, it does seem that the link between sort of uh, gender nonconformity and Yiddish um, uh, and to a certain extent, sort of queerness and homosexuality. Uh, there's, there's an interesting history with that. Um, and I think perhaps, especially in the UK. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm looking at the chat, there is a lot. Oh, I just, I just wanted to add something uh -huh. in there, um, about, if, if folk are interested in knowing more about different uh, early late late 19th early 20th century male impersonators or as we we're calling them proto drag kings if you go to unlikes um socials our marketing team did a brilliant job of highlighting incredible drag kings like um gladys bentley who was um i'll just read this gladys's career skyrocketed when she appeared at harry hansbury's clam house in new york in the 1920s as a black lesbian cross-dressing performer she headlined in the early 1930s at harlem's a banking club where she was backed up by a chorus line of drag queens and that that always that fascinated me when i started reading about these drag kings because it's the opposite now you know we we know about rupaul's drag queens and there's usually like a whole row of drag queens and i love drag queens by the way and then there's one drag king um whereas it used to be the other way around um and i just find that i personally found that quite fascinating i just that's just my fact of the day okay goodbye <laughs> <laughs> Yes, we have about five minutes left because uh, at 11 we have our uh, theater class, but maybe just a couple of announcements. Um, thank you very much for joining us, Natalie and Ashley. We are extremely uh, excited about your project. I hope it, you know, fingers crossed that, that it, you match your goal and that thank everything you. goes well. Uh, stay in touch with us and we can also update our audience on your project. Absolutely, we'll, we'll definitely, um, I thank you, Paul, for putting that link in uh, to Polari, what Ashley was talking about. Um, I found that really fascinating. Um, and if, um, Jana, if folk do have questions for Phil, I know he couldn't be here today, but he graciously said, you know, please, I'll come back on again and do, and make sure I do one. And, and then I'm sure people will have questions um, after this and uh and phil is also continuing to do research so phil could come and join us again if you would have him that would be great can i, can I ask you something very quick very quick um i did put this in the chat have you heard of claire waldorf uh no can you tell me she was a very very popular german butch um sort of male impersonator singer and uh she actually was jewish she was fairly out butch lesbian and miraculously she and her lovers survived uh, the war in hinterlands of Germany somehow, but she had very famous records and I put the name of one of them in the chat, which was about check all the men out of the Reichstag, like Uta Lemper covered it later, <laughs> but it's, you know, wow, you know, or whatever, but she's, her, her voice is unbelievable. It's, it's like, uh, you know, a file. <laughs> it's so sharp, but I just wondered because maybe Pepe, I mean, of course, Gladys Bentley and everybody else, but the proximity seems like maybe Pepe would have been more likely an influence on somebody like Claire Waldorf in terms of years and in terms of, you know, being in Central Europe. So okay. I think that would be worth exploring. I'm definitely going, going to go down that rabbit hole. Thank you. Sure. Claire Waldorf spelled W-A-L-D-O-R-A. D-O-F-F. -F. Yeah, there was a lot of problem with uh, autocorrect, but you'll find her. Claire, oh, Claire yeah. W-A-L-D-O-F-F. -L <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> of course, thank you. Thank you. Yay, that's great. We learned too. <laughs> yes, it's always good to make a shit <laughs> of any kind. All right, so just a couple of announcements. Uh, we're very happy to share with you um, our next uh, event, which is going to happen in a month. It's a very big event, our annual fundraiser, and we will have a play that was 
written specially for Zoom. It can't be performed on stage. It's specifically a Zoom play. I'm sending the link for you in the chat. It does feature drug performance also. <laughs> so <laughs> yes, I'm very eager to put any kind of drug performance in anything. And here it was, it was just a perfect fit. So I'm very happy to have it there. And it's going to happen on May 23rd at 10 a.m. Pacific time. We have such great actors as Avi Hoffman and Susan Toren in the play. So I hope you will enjoy it greatly. And then for those of you who want to learn the language of Pepe, <laughs> we have a big intensive program coming up in the summer. Uh, and the program, the focus on the program is theater. So we also will have uh, theater workshops by um, Rafi Goldwasser and Daniel Galai uh, as a part of that. And hopefully it will be a tradition of ours to incorporate theater in every summer program we're doing. Um, that's our hope in first on Zoom and then hopefully also in person in San Diego someday. <laughs> So everybody is invited to participate in these events. You can also reach us at info at yaaana.com. Um, so we hope to be in touch with you. And uh, thank you so much, everybody, for coming. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Stay healthy and strong. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>